my pleasure to introduce the next speaker, um, uh, Dr. Andrew Wang. And Dr. Wang is a um, professor of medicine and the chief of GI at the University of Virginia. He is a, an expert in endos advanced endoscopy. I think he is one of the pioneers in the U.S. Uh, using ESD, an endoscopic submucosal dissection, uh, to uh, manage the precancerous GI lesions and also the resection of early GI cancers. Welcome, Dr. Wang. It's uh, such a pleasure to be here. Um, you know, this is a, a critically important topic, uh, amazing conference, great group of colleagues and friends. Uh, really thank you to Rob and Juha for organizing and for inviting me. Really thank you for, to CARE and also to the donors. Uh, without uh, philanthropy, really, much of our work uh, is not possible. All right, this is a topic that I've been passionate about for quite some time. Nothing to disclose. So with respect to the purpose of screening, really what we're trying to do is detect gastric cancer early. Uh, additionally, we'd like to detect precancerous or pre-malignant gastric lesions. So if the purpose is to prevent or cure early gastric cancer, then the topic must also include surveillance of pre-malignant lesions in addition to screening. As uh, Doug so eloquently went over yesterday, um, really there's no screening guidelines in the U.S. Um, societies. Uh, the ACG guideline is coming out and we anticipate that. There's also some um, discordance within the uh, American um, guidelines in terms of surveillance. And if you read the AGA closely enough, it makes, gives you some cover. Um, however, um, you know, in, initially it says, it suggests against endoscopic surveillance. So I do, uh, actually, I'm a little more partial to the British Society Gastro Guidelines, which we heard about, that recommend that patients at higher risk for gastric adenocarcinoma, including gastric atrophy and gastric intestinal metaplasia, should undergo full systematic endoscopic protocol of the stomach with photo documentation and a minimum exam time of seven minutes. We'll touch, that, touch on that again. Surveillance is recommended at three-year intervals in patients with extensive atrophy or IM, and um, Blanco did a great job at explaining some of those um, <coughs> areas uh, just now. So we know that from prior presentations uh, in Japan and Korea, where um, at various ages, in Japan the age has gone from 40 to 50, but using endoscopy um, and screening every two years, that more patients are diagnosed with local or regional earlier stage gastric cancer, and actually patients survive better. So is endoscopy the way? Yes, I'm an advanced endoscopist. I believe I'm, you know, I'm biased, but uh, yes. It enables at this time, without better biomarkers, a detailed visualization of the mucosa. We can evaluate it for environmental versus autoimmune metaplastic atrophic gastritis. Uh, you know, in this day and age, you can't order a shilling test, so I believe we're kind of the first people to diagnose pernicious anemia in many. You can get tissue. And uh, one question that we can talk about later, could one normal endoscopy be enough in asymptomatic patients from increased risk ethnic groups without other risk factors? Um, we'll see. So this is the all-famous Korea cascade, and I only bring it up because all of these lesions can be diagnosed and identify it endoscopically. So this is the power of endoscopy when done properly. Who to screen? We've talked about all these factors, geographic, ethnic populations. These are really uh, surrogate markers for really um, what we're trying to get at. Family history is an important clue, as is gastric IM. So, you know, I was trained in ESD um, by a Korean endoscopist uh, from Daegu, uh, Professor Hyunsoo Kim, wh who was with us for a year when I was an advanced fellow. And then I also was trained in ESD further by Fabian Amora and our friends at the National Cancer Center. This is around 2008, 2009. And it, <clears throat> as a primary referral center in Virginia, um, you know, I was following the Japanese methodology. I wanted to do 30 ESDs in the stomach before I moved on to the esophagus or stomach or rectum and other places. Well, after two years and only getting about five or six, some of which are outside of the Japanese criteria, I realized very quickly that something was wrong. 
And, uh, you know, there was not this popular awareness. There were disparities. And, uh, you know, this is how I got interested in this field. So early on, we looked at a swath of patients from Virginia. Virginia, where I live in central Virginia, is 70% uh, Caucasian. There's about 18% African American and 7% Asian American. And the gastric IM prevalence was about 5%. From Rob's work, it's as high as 12% in part, parts of the U.S. And family history, we found, as you all know, a strong association with gastric IM. We also found that in our population of mainly Caucasian Americans, that the underinsured or uninsured and those on uh, Medicaid had a higher frequency of chronic gastritis and IM, as you have also heard about. So we actually looked further and looked at our swath of patients who had pathologically diagnosed IM on biopsies from EGD for any reason, distilled this down to 675 patients, 14 of whom over time went on to develop cancer. Uh, we looked at a controlled group of biopsy-proven patients with normal stomach, uh, over 1,200, only one over time went on to develop cancer. Um, the associations, are, as you might expect and we've talked about, um, H. pylori predominant in the IM group, uh, risk of subsequent percentage of patients, 2% uh, in IM versus almost none in the negative for IM. So when looked at it differently, the actuarial risk of gastric cancer pro progression in our population, um, IM to cancer, was 0.3 at one year, 1.7% at five years, and 3.7% at 10 years. So even in central Virginia, it's a problem. Um, these are data. This is a study that I've liked for a long time, a large population-based study from Sweden. Huge numbers, over 400,000 participants, uh, average follow-up over 10 years. And they found, uh, when you distill it down, that for patients in this low-risk Caucasian population who had IM, 1 in 39 over 20 years would develop cancer, so a little more than 2%. So gastric IM, I don't have to tell you guys, uh, is a pre-malignant condition and a key endoscopic marker for gastric cancer risk. Atrophic gastritis probably is. How do we endoscopically screen? Well, importantly, take your time. Use high-definition image-enhanced modalities, as we've talked about. Biopsy areas that are raised or depressed concerning for dysplasia, early gastric cancer. Put concerning specimens in separate jars so you might be able to come back if it's something that's resectable. Use the uh, five-station Sydney protocol, which we've heard about. Don't miss an opportunity to do a careful gastric exam if EGD is done for another reason. And how often to screen, that's a really good question. So even in the hands of experts, uh, this is a study looking at missed upper GI cancers. When you look at only the uh, studies that really focused on the stomach, the range of missed, or what we think is missed cancers within three years of EGD was between 5 and 26% even amongst experts. So there is room for improvement, and this is not an easy task we're trying to accomplish. What then are the keys to good slash high quality endoscopy? It's important to clean the stomach, wash with water and some ethicone. Good sedation is very important too. Endoscopy can be done in the unsedated, but in the States, uh, there's a different kind of cultural expectation, but really good sedation allows you the time to get good imaging. Use a good scope, as we talked about. Really, you need a high definition scope with image enhanced features is a must. Optical magnification, near focus, desirable. Having a good pathologist, a luxury, but really important. And, uh, you know, this is, I think, an important thing. We prep the colon for colonoscopy, and we have all these quality indicators. Actually, in Asia, there's a prep for the stomach. In Japan, patients ingest water and pronase with semethicone. This is from a Korean study that showed 100 mils of warm water with a uh, semethicone like agent, DMPS, with with sodium bicarb and pronase, 20 minutes before an EGD resulted in improved uh, visualization by RCT. However, in the States, I think my anesthesiologist probably canceled the case if I made them swallow that. So, you know, these are the challenges that we have. Uh, <clears throat> it's known to me, a friend of mine at Stanford, uh, he drives a Ferrari around, and I think if you have a, uh, the ability to drive from here down to Carmel in, you know, at speed safely, I think it's great, but when we're talking about endoscopy, Drive carefully. This is a famous study that I think Doug uh, brought up yesterday as well, but from Singapore. And you'll note that you know when endoscopists are divided into short and long examers, uh, and, and a long exam time is seven minutes, not looking at the stomach, it's for the whole EGD, the whole EGD, seven minutes. They found statistically more uh, high-risk gastric lesions, 2.5 increased uh, odds. So seven minutes for the whole EGD. 
Morphology and pathology are important. These are the Paris classifications that we've all heard about. Um, <clears throat> even back then, in 2003, it was known that depressed and raised lesions um, are what we're looking for. So where is the lesion? This is an atrophic antrum. You really see no folds. Um, in this group, I think it's, uh, you know, everyone can pick it out, but there's something that catches your eye, one o'clock at the prepyloric antrum. Um, this is not even with optical mag, but just old. The, this is a first generation NBI, and you can see uh, 2A plus 2C lesion with some amorphous nature in the center. This is uh, antral high grade dysplasia. So, other pa patterns that to rec you know, it's important for us to recognize in patients with H. pylori, initially you get a distal gastritis. Uh, when it progresses into a multifocal inflammation, a pangastritis, uh, then you have, can see the intestinal metaplasia and the atrophy and the hot spots, the antrum, incisure, and lesser curve. These are the areas that we should spend the most time looking at. Uh, in contradistinction, in patients with autoimmune gastritis, you see a corpus predominant inflammation and intestinal metaplasia. And so this is an example of a patient who clearly has celiac disease from scalloping, but also when you do the careful endoscopic exam of the stomach, there's effacement of the proximal stomach. Uh, this is a patient with autoimmune metaplastic atrophic gastritis and pernicious anemia. So uh, Doug also did present our friend Fabian's uh, um, SACE, uh, Systematic Alphanumeric Coded Endoscopy, which is really a recapitulation of uh, the Japanese methodological exam, which I think is uh, something important to have seen and know about. In the U.S., it's hard to get, um, you know, convince my colleagues to take 26 pictures of the stomach, but really I think the pictures are just a surrogate for taking your time and doing a careful exam. This is just an example of a stomach I've cleaned. Insecure is placed horizontally, and in this kind of situation, these are the cardinal directions, anterior, posterior, greater, and lesser curve. And so as you just pull back, um, here anterior, posterior, greater, lesser, anterior, posterior, greater, lesser, you just pull back through the stomach, and if you do it in a systematic way, the stomach's been cleaned, you don't need to take all those pictures. I do take a large number of pictures, but for the purposes of this, it's really just about seeing every little square inch of the stomach in a careful way, um, all the way back in the various stations of the antrum, the body. And then here we're working up into the proximal stomach. Uh, we'll see the uh, Z line soon. This, this whole exam took one minute, and one minute, 10 seconds. We retroflex looking at the fundus swing the scope around, looking at the, cardi uh, the, um, the cardia and the lesser curve, which is a hot spot. We push the scope in, and if you've done it uh, properly, um, you started, you've ended where you've begun. And then you can go on to use NBI or other technology to look at areas that you know, really have caught your eye. So the Sydney protocol, we've heard about the importance of that. Um, it started off as a research tool, but it detects virtually all patients with H. pylori, but it can miss intestinal metaplasia in up to 50% of cases. So mapping biopsies are necessary, but not sufficient for IM. We must retrain our eyes, and so you, for this example, can you see the man looking at you and also in profile? NBI and other optical enhancements looking at the blue light uh, wavelengths um, are important. And as you can see here in a patient with IM, this almost looks like an adenoma. There's an increased mass, mass capillary size. It's orderly. Uh, there's a light blue crest sign. If you have an optically enhanced scope, you can see this kind of bluish pattern. In patients with dysplasia, there's an amorphous nature uh, and perhaps even um, morphology change. So these are the, some of the tricks we use to pick it out. Jim Buxbaum, who's going to be moderating, I think, the next section, uh, published this important study. And in a blind tandem study, found that uh, NBI targeted biopsies and the Sydney protocol for mapping were complementary. And because of this, both should be performed, increasing the uh, percent of IM detected. So methylene blue is also a commercially available uh, vital stain. It's taken up by intestinal type epithelium, even if it's um, not supposed to be there, such as in the esophagus or stomach. So this, um, when sprayed on, onto the mucosa over time, there's an uptake, and you can see the IM is stained blue. In patients with dysplasia, you have a blue uptake, but then it becomes amorphous. 
Acetic acid chromoendoscopy, taking a page from our OB um, GYN colleagues, they've been doing this a long time for cervical cancer. 1.5% acetic acid, basically vinegar, um, brings out the columnar epithelium. So this so-called acetyl-white reaction can also target you when you're not using really NBI, just white light, to find IM. This is an example kind of putting it all together. A patient of mine who was referred to me said to have dysplasia in the stomach. You can see the stomach is very bumpy. There's atrophic um, changes. As you can start to look at it more, you, your eyes start to pick out this uh, central area that is more discolored. It's a little bit raised, uh, maybe depressed in the center. In this in situation, I'm using a scope with near-focus endoscopy, and you can see the center, it's a little bit more amorphous around areas of uh, clear IM. Um, this was at least, in my mind, low-grade dysplasia, and sometimes it's hard to tell low versus high. Um, <clears throat> we plan to resect this, and so I'm here using methylene blue to try to make sure I get the proper borders. Uh, you can use indigo carmine if you want to look at the pits and the morphology. Methylene blue, again, will stain for the IM. I'll just fast forward here a little bit, and then you can see kind of more clearly the, uh, le the uh, edges of this lesion. And uh, similarly, we mark it out and uh, perform ESD using a clip and dental floss retraction because I'm also director of the endo unit and I'm kind of cheap. And uh, it went well. So. <clears throat> The effect of one-time screening was described in this recent paper in GUT. And in this study out of China, over 600,000 participants, they're about evenly divided into control versus a screening group. And only about one-third of these patients who were in the screening group went on for you know, one-time EGD. And they found that over 10 years, the incidence and mortality was reduced 23 and 57 percent, respectively, in those who were screened, and if you take all comers, like an intention to treat all invited, still incidence 10% or 14% and mortality 31% decrease. So just the effect of a one-time screening EGD. What's the case for surveillance then? We do need more data. We've talked about that. This conference will be fantastic, I think, going forward. Um, but with respect to premalignant lesions or early gastric cancer, does surveillance save more lives, find more cancers? We need more data. Um, some examples I found recently, this is from JAMA Network Open, recently published a case control study of 4,000 patients out of Japan. This was a secondary analysis of an RCT. In high-risk patients, uh, new gastric cancers were detected within approximately one year after patients already had very intensive index endoscopic exam in 2.6% of cases. So about 3%, which was similar to the rate of early gastric uh, detection on index endoscopy. So just within one year, 3% of patients were found to have cancer. This is an important and uh, often quoted study. I usually quote it about H. pylori, but if you look at actually in this group of patients out of Korea who had endoscopic resection of gastric cancer treated with H. pylori, we know that those treated with H. pylori did better with fewer metachronous lesions, but even if you look over time, they still have a not insignificant cumulative incidence. So in these patients, surveillance it would be important. So surveillance for gastric IM, if the initial EGD was not sufficient, I do suggest repeating a careful exam. If, is surveillance reasonable? I believe so. Who and what should be surveilled? Multifocal or incomplete IM, invisible dysplasia, that which you can't find again, autoimmune metaplastic atrophic gastritis, and those with a family history. How should we conduct surveillance uh, endoscopically, as we had talked about? And what should the surveillance interval be? Maybe we can dis discuss this further, but it's hard to say. I still consider two to three years in patients without dysplasia, in higher risk patients, perhaps annually, one to, one to two years. I do follow the MAPS-2 guideline, which uh, we've heard about, and uh, Professor Kuypers um, talked about some. And uh, this is uh, actually kind of an important wrinkle. And uh, Juha and I, I know well, Juha is at the back of the room, but um, we, with the AGA and the Clinical Practice Update Committee, were had this task of looking at surveillance after curative ESD across the GI tract. And Juha is responsible for a great section on gastric, uh, e gastric surveillance after resection of early gastric cancer. Really, we uh, were trying to make a first stake approximation of how to survey these patients who are clearly at increased risk. There's really very 
a much a need for more data, even extrapolating from Japan and the data we have, it's really a shot in the dark. So this is something I think as the field progresses, we need to also think about. So when I give this talk to our younger colleagues who you know, are on TikTok and not on Twitter, they don't read the literature, they don't even look at Google, I uh, try to bring it home. And in this era of equitable and personal medicine, if Rita Wilson is gonna come to your clinic and talk about a little dysphagia, you think about scoping her. Well, Tom Hanks is there too. I've heard from Nick Shaheen that you know, if um, a Caucasian woman comes with dysphagia, you're statistically more likely to find something if you scope her Caucasian husband. And so if you're gonna scope Tom too, then you know, when Aquafina, who is like my daughters, uh, half Chinese, half Korean, shows up for her 45-year-old screening colonoscopy, I would suggest ask about family history, consider screening endoscopy for her. Same for Halle Berry, African-Americans, high risk of colon cancer and gastric cancer. Paolo Pascal um, from Chile, not from Andean Latin America, but still increased risk. And his alter ego, the Mandalorian, is an orphan, so lower socioeconomic status. Consider the Mandalorian also. Take home points, uh, screening for gastric cancer and precursors should be done by endoscopy. EGD is the way, consider it in patients with risk factors for gastric cancer, including ethnicity, family history. Careful exam is important. Cleaning, pattern recognition, systematic endoscopy with seven minutes or longer. Image enhanced techniques, and AI we'll hear about soon, I think will be hopefully a game changer. Surveillance for certain patients at high risk, uh, including those with IM, likely beneficial. More data, of course, is needed. I would like to thank uh, those fellows who, starting 10 years ago, they're now all you know, attendings or have uh, got, done well in practice, really helped us kickstart this of over a decade ago, and we've been able to present our data at many places, and now at Stanford, so I'm very thankful. Lastly, I wanna uh, just mention Ed Rochella. Ed is, uh, he's like my second father. I grew up with him. He's been a mentor, really like my dad. Past president um, of the Public Health Education Society. He was at, with the NHLBI for 30 years and saved millions of lives through blood pressure education. Uh, we lost him last year due to GI cancer. Ed and Eileen, um, who is kind of like my mom, um, decided to um, have all of the donations um, in memory of Ed sent to our UVA GI Research Fund. And with this uh, funding, um, we're able to you know, fund some of our gastric cancer as well as other research. So wanted to just take a moment and thank them. Thank you all.